Hello. Have you ever read a theology book? Did you understand it? Well, yes, theology is difficult to understand, but, and that's the topic of this video here, it's often made more difficult to understand by the big words that theologians use. So the question arises, can theology be expressed in simple language? I believe it can, and it should be. So, let's have a look. C.S. Lewis said, I have come to the conviction that if you cannot translate your thoughts into uneducated language, then your thoughts were confused. How to translate is the test of having really understood one's own meaning. Many of the terms used in theology books come straight from Latin or Greek. The effect of this is to make theology hard to understand, and not to say make it seem archaic and irrelevant. Often it seems that theologians simply don't know how to express themselves in simple English. But I believe we must and we can find a word or phrase or sentence, it doesn't matter, as a name or label for the idea that will carry the meaning clearly and unambiguously to a modern speaker of English. The following examples are taken from the book Christian Theology and Introduction by Alistair McGrath, <coughs> fifth edition. This is an excellent book, but <coughs> it has a lot of confusing terminology. Here's an example, typology, and McGrath explains this, typology in which a historical event is seen as a prefiguring of some aspect of the coming of Christ. He explains it. So I say, why not just say prefiguring and can the obscure and confusing term typology? Get rid of the term typology. Who can understand what that's supposed to mean? It's actually pure Greek. Why not use a more English word, prefiguring, if that's what it means? Why not call it prefiguring? But possibly the thing causing the greatest confusion is when the terms used do have a clear meaning in modern English, but not the one the theologians intended. This happens because the meaning of words changes over time. Uh, so the, the word is borrowed from, English, from Latin or Greek uh, in its original meaning, but then, as happens in every language all the time, words change their meaning. A notable example of a word borrowed from Latin that's changed its meaning is passion. In Latin, passio meant suffering, hence the passion of the Christ. But now... <laughs> It means something different. And so, I think it was most unfortunate that Mel Gibson chose this title for his film. Another example occurs with the Latin word recapitulatio. It's on page 324. All these examples come from McGrath's book. And McGrath explains that this is recapitulation. But he's seemingly unaware that the English word recapitulation has shifted to now mean saying again. Recapitulatio needs to be explained something like this. This is the actual meaning, doing it again right this time. This is the meaning that um, theologians use it in. So they're talking about Christ doing again what Adam did right this time. That's what they mean when they say recapitulatio. Theologians like to translate word for word, so they nearly always reject the use of an expanded phrase for their term. But this restriction is unnecessary, and in fact, it makes good translation impossible. So I say, the Latin word recapitulatio, we don't have to find one word to translate it, especially if that one word is misleading. Why can't we use an extended phrase? 
or clause. Here's another one. The impassibility of God. This is a ridiculous word. Totally unknown in normal English, but easily confusable with impossibility. The Latin itself was directly copied from the Greek apatheia. But it wouldn't do to say apathy or insufferability. Those words have... You see how, how this Greek word how this word comes from this Greek word, but it's changed its meaning, apathy and insufferability. Similar again, but again changed its meaning. But we don't have to do it in one word. This is the point. Why can't we use a phrase like God's inability to suffer? Or the idea that God cannot suffer. We don't have to get one word for impassibility especially when the words chosen are incomprehensible or misleading. Some more examples. This is a Greek word, hypostasis, and part by part translated into Latin, substantia, from which we get the English word substance. But again, the English word, originally borrowed from Latin, has drifted in meaning, and it's not what we want here. So what's intended by hypostasis, Greek hypostasis, and the Latin substantia, is common nature, shared underlying essence, what the three individuals of the Trinity have in common. Three separate, we could say there are three separate individuals in the Trinity, yet in essence they are the same, or the same underneath. That's what is intended by these words. There's another one. Theologians say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. But proceed in modern English means go ahead, don't stop. You proceed from A to B. So I think it's best simply to say the Holy Spirit comes from the Father or is sent out from the Father. Not a great deal of difference, but just a little simpler, clearer and a little more accurate. There's another one, the threefold office of Christ. Theologians talk about this. But again, this word office has changed its meaning in English. And what they really mean is the threefold function of Christ. So let's stop saying the threefold office of Christ and simply say the threefold function of Christ. And now here's my uh, last example. Original sin. Think about it for a while. What does this phrase mean in normal English? Have a think about it. If you had, hadn't heard this phrase before, you hadn't, you'd never read a theology book, and you were, uh, you, you were confronted with this phrase, what would you take it to mean in normal, plain English? I think most people would take it to mean innovative. For example, as we say, original thinking. It means innovative thinking. So, <laughs> original sin. Do we mean innovative? <laughs> Being innovative. But the intended meaning is actually much better indicated if you say the original sin. Notice how just using this word the brings a subtle change in meaning in English, the original sin. So like we're talking about the first sin, the sin of Adam and Eve. That's what they mean. Um, it's interesting to note here that th this phrase, original, original sin, the word original comes from Latin, uh, but Latin had no the. So the subtle change in meaning that's indicated in modern English when we add the, was impossible in Latin. But if, 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 for example, a speaker stood up today and said, my topic is original vice, people, I think, would take it to mean innovative and imaginative vice. <laughs> but if you say, my topic today is the original vice, then people would take it to mean the first one, the forerunner of all the later ones. And that's what we're trying to get. Um, in this phrase, original sin. So just the, just the adding of the word the, 
I think, can clarify it. But I say, surely it's best simply to say the first sin. If someone objects and says this doesn't get the subtle meanings of original sin, I reply, who gets the basic meaning of original sin, let alone its subtle meanings, when you use this confusing phrase? I conclude by saying it's essential to express this stuff Sorry, a little glitch there. I conclude by saying it's essential to express this stuff in plain English. Not only will others then understand what you are going on about, but also it'll become much clearer to you.